So welcome to our body horror panel, uh, the new body horror um, for SPX 2020, our virtually distant bodies <laughs> in other spaces panel. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and let everyone uh, introduce themselves uh, before as we get started. So if y'all want to, whoever wants to, um, Kate, do you want to start off or? Sure. Hi, I'm Kate LaCour. I'm the creator of uh, Vivisectionary, which is out from Thanagraphics and the webcomic The Disciple, which is on Study Group, and just a whole bunch of mini comics. I'll go next, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm Sun Leong. I'm a mixed indigenous cartoonist, writer, and artist. Um, my newest book is A Map to the Sun, and I'm working right now on the next volume of my uh, sci-fi comic, Prism Stalker. Uh, I'm Julia Grosser. My book, Vision, came out uh, this, no, not this month, September just started. It came out at the end of August uh, from Fanagraphics. And uh, it's my third graphic novel with them. And uh, it's about like a, a 19th century spinster who's in love with a ghost. And I am Ezra Clayton Daniels. I did a book called Upgrade Soul that came out a couple years ago. That's body horror adjacent. And I did a book called Bottom Feeders with Ben Passmore that came out on Fanographics last year. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you for, for being here. And um, I'm really excited about this panel and to talk to you all today. So uh, I'm Rachel Miller. I am I just got my doctorate from the Ohio State University, and now I teach comics at the Columbus College of Art and Design. I, I focus on uh, feminist media studies, in particular zines and mini comics from the 90s, so that's a little bit about me, but I wanna talk more about all y'all. So um, I was thinking as I was putting together my questions for this panel about a panel that I went to last year at SPX with Emily Carroll, and she was talking about specifically um, you know, how to generate uh, horror in comics, like how to approach horror in comics, because comics kind of work differently than film. You can't have things like jump scares, that sort of thing. So what I'm interested in asking you all, since this is our body horror panel, um, why is body horror a good fit for comics um, in particular? And this is for all of you, so anyone who wants to jump in. Can you give us a definition of body horror? Sure. So um, body horror being the like the modification or the manipulation of the body in some way. Um, so either exploring how the body is grotesque, maybe delving into more fantastic representations of the body. Um, I'm thinking I, of like, um, I think in film when we, we think about body horror, we typically think about like blood and guts and gore. But what I'm noticing with all your comics is you're, you have kind of different approaches to manipulating the body or, or transforming the body. So, so I'm interested in why, why, why are comics a good fit for, for that kind of work? I mean, the, not to call the premise of the panel into question, but like, it's hard for me to imagine a horror that is not rooted in the body in some way that doesn't address like the inherent uh, fragility of life, the permeability of uh, skin and other boundaries. Uh, so it's hard to say. Uh, it's hard to say how it's distinct. But uh, when, you, when you're talking about physical experiences, there's so much that you can do with imagery. Um, you know, one really important thing that film has that comics don't have is that you can make weird noises. Uh, sound effects are very problematic in comics. You have to spell them out. It kind of, to my mind, takes the reader out of the illusion of the story. Uh, some people I think do them more naturally than I do. Uh, but uh, you have this enormous canvas of uh, 
creating disturbing images. Uh, you have uh, something that I think even prose horror writers don't have access to, uh, which is that you are, uh, you can make somebody look at something. You can't force somebody to visualize something with words, but you can force them to look, which is a very powerful thing to do. Uh, and the experience of seeing something upsetting uh, is uh, you, you can't shut it out and it's hard to forget once you've seen a traumatic thing. Uh, and the advantage that we have with that over film is that film is much more passive. Uh, to read a comic, uh, the reader has to actually participate. They have to hold the book and turn the pages and move their eyes physically from one panel to the next. Like, they're, if it's a zoetrope, they're the wheel of the zoetrope. They have to create the movement that makes the story progress, uh, which makes them culpable to a certain extent in the things that happen in the story in a way that they are not in a film where not just the imagery, but also the pacing um, and the movement, the timing, that's the same as pacing, but where all that is controlled by the filmmaker and you just have to sit and absorb it. Does that make sense? I think also just like the specificity of expression that comics um, allows the creator to have, like how I draw like tumescent flesh is way different than how like Ezra approaches it or Kate or Julia. Um, and I think just that specificity itself is like so valuable. Um, and yeah, like Julia was saying, like we have, in addition to being able to use prose, we have our visuals. So um, it's a very unique, like, it's not as like aggressive as like um, film, like uh, horror on film, but I feel like there's something more contemplative and meditative that um, the visual medium can give to, to horror and depictions of it. Yeah. Second, everything that you guys have just said, I think that's all like exactly in line with the way I think about horror comics. I think there's also something about horror comics that's unique against film because film is such a collaborative medium. I think there's something extra horror extra horrifying about being given a glimpse into a disturbed auteuristic mind that I think you get in comics that you don't necessarily get in film. Uh, I think the scariest films to my mind are the ones that lean closest to that, like Cronenberg's approach to body horror I think is probably the most disturbing, but like, you know, like the mass market, super mainstream horror movies, I don't think many people find scary because they're just so like made by committee. And I think there's something especially in, in indie comics that's disturbing. Like indie horror comics are the scariest thing <laughs> I can imagine in the horror manga comics, especially. Um, and I think they're far scarier than horror when it's done in the mainstream. Not to disparage mainstream comics necessarily. That's not what we're here for, but. I'm here for that, fuck them. You can say fuck them, right? Yeah, okay, she's not. So I agree with 100% with all the things you all said. You all said all my good ideas, but better than I would have said. But I guess the, the only other piece is that I don't know that, indie, that comics are as scary in the like jump scare sort of, um, uh, even that's kind of uh, tired. But necessarily, it's physically impossible to do a jump scare in a comic because you yeah. can't surprise somebody. I don't even the know closest that. that you can come is if you put something surprising oh, at the top of a new page. Yeah, on like the the verso side of a new page. But I think comics have more potential to be creepy and get under your skin. You know, you can see a scary movie, and I'll have that stuff coming back to me like of a whole cloth in a PTSD flashback kind of way but it won't creep me out and nauseate me the way a creepy story is that, um, as you were saying, Julia, you have to be a little complicit in putting together um, and that could play a little differently each time. And that when you read it each time, it reads a little bit differently. 
in a way that viewing a movie a second time doesn't quite achieve, that has a, a real creepy, like reenacting the trauma kind of uh, vibe that I find less scary, but much more upsetting, um, which I think is just a more interesting thing to provoke. Yeah, so I feel I like- this comic, oh. Go ahead, Julia. Uh, I have this comic, this is not exactly body horror, although there are elements of body horror in the comic, I think. Maybe it is, uh, but this is, I think, one of my scarier comics where uh, what happens is that somebody, it's called Dark Age, uh, these two young people are exploring a cave and then one of them gets stuck and the other one has to go for help. Uh, they only have one lamp, so the person who goes for help has to take it and the other person has to wait in the dark and the reader stays with the person who's waiting in the dark. So the light gets less and less and less, and then it comes darkness. And then there's just several panels where, there are several pages where there are only fully black panels with their hand colored. So there's like little kind of staticky fragments, but um, totally black. And it goes on for, I want to say six pages, which is a lot. Um, and not that I would necessarily expect a reader to pause and look at every single panel, but it creates a sense of discomfort. Uh, it's unnerving, I think, not having the experience of reading it without knowing what's gonna happen. Uh, but you have no idea how long it's gonna go on or if that's how the book is going to end. And you, experience something not unlike what the character is experiencing where he is unable to do anything but wait and see how it shakes out he's stuck in place and so are you uh and this is again like an experience a physical experience that you have in reading a book that you cannot have in watching a movie does that make sense yeah, that definitely makes sense to me. As uh, Kate was talking and as you, Julia, were talking, I was thinking about the first time that I read um, Black Hole and like by, by Charles Burns. And I remember like one, in one of the first pages, you see one of the kids who's living in the woods. And I just had this like, like visceral, like shock, like having to like uh, come to that image and like not really understand what I was looking at and like have this sustained moment with that image. Um, I was sitting like in a dorm room by myself and I had to like put the book away, right? Because, but yeah, I think that that ability to like meditate on an image or to make us look at something in this sustained way um, is something that that comics have over pretty much every other medium, maybe. Um, Sloan, you were going to make a point earlier. Did you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I was just thinking like, I feel like reading prose and reading comics is a very like active um, process, whereas something like with film, you're more of a passive um, observer. You're just getting all this information, all the sensory information, whereas with um, comics, you're filling in a lot of detail, um, no matter like, even if you're reading like a really realistically drawn um, style of comic, you're filling it in with all the extra sensory information as a reader. Um, and I feel like doing that work also kind of brings it closer to you. Right, and that closeness is unnerving and uncomfortable. Um, so I'm interested in, in why, why approach visualizing the body in this way, visualizing grotesque bodies, um, bodies that we are uncomfortable looking at. Um, what is it about this that feels pr like a productive space to tell stories? For you all. I'm not sure about productive. Um, I guess it's just, I don't know, it's just another facet of life that I like to, ex I like to explore. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the term productive. I don't know how to take that. <laughs> I guess I maybe a better a better term might be like what is it that's like fascinating or like that um you know why represent the body in this way but yeah maybe productive is like too too academic or clinical a, a term sorry I cut you 
I was going to say maybe ripe would be a good term. <laughs> it's a ripe space to explore with regards to horror. Um, I think for me, well, I, maybe I wanted to say something in regards to Julia's point that, that they made in the, in the beginning of the um, panel, which was that like making the distinction between body horror and other types of horror. I think for me, body horror is specifically a horror that um, originates and emanates from within your own body versus like horror that's like about a ghost or a monster or whatever. Like this is like changes that are happening in your body that are out of your control. And that is where the horror comes from. To me, that's like, that's the way I see body horror. And I think the reason I, I, you know, this is something that like I've always been, I've always gravitated to body horror and I never really understood why. It was just like a type of horror that I really loved. And I didn't realize until a few years ago when I was on a panel that the reason I think body horror is so scary is because I've lived almost my entire adult life without health insurance or without good health insurance. So like this idea of like, having a weird ache or pain in your body or like a bump or discoloration is like the yeah, scariest thing. Yeah, you don't have thing. the sense that your body is going to be necessarily repaired. You're, you know, you're like a Romanoff. Like if you, if you, if the envelope of the body is permeated, you don't know that that can ever come back together again. Right, if you can't get medical damaged help. Forever. Right, or the idea that like if you did go to the doctor, it's gonna bankrupt you and it's gonna ruin your entire life. So you have to like live with this ailment and figure out a way to pass it all by yourself without clinical help because it's the only option you have. And that is like, the, it's, like still the scariest thing I can imagine. And that I think where is, is where a lot of this comes from. But it's weird, I will say that Cronenberg is like lauded as like the all time great body horror storyteller and he comes from Canada, which is a country where <laughs> health care and health insurance is not such an issue. Uh, that's just interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, as, as living as a grad student for the past however many years, the health insurance situation is real and it's really bad, but yeah, so I don't, Kate or Julia, did you got, did either of you want to talk about why why um, you're fascinated with with depicting the body in this way? Or I'll try. Um, I worry though that it's one of those things that's just like such a natural like, part of my orientation and personality that I would I'm like reverse justifying it to myself because um, yeah, even if even when I start out to do something different, I always come back to this. It's really the most compelling thing to me. Um, I think what gets under my skin the most about it is um, incarnation, that it's like inherently ups not just strange, but disturbing um, being an embodied spirit or mind. Um, and coming at this as a Christian, uh, either because of my interest in this or vice versa, I don't even know, that um, the idea of uh, this um, very base material vessel uh, containing your essence is uh, very, very um, uh, banal and shocking at the same time. Um, and especially because some of the most upsetting stuff that happens to your body is super routine and banal. Like if I found a lump in my breast and you know was freaking out about my mortality and what it would mean for changing my, like that's such a yawn. Everybody knows some auntie who had a lump in their breast, you know, or uh, you know had a prostate thing. Or we've all gone through puberty and we're all going to get old. You know, it's um, it's not even interesting in a certain way, and yet it's uh, so profoundly dehumanizing and like the most human experience. I don't know, I can't get enough of thinking about it. Um, and at the same time, I would like, love to never think about it again because it's so upsetting. Um, and it's just such a rich vein to tap into. Kate, can I ask you a question? This is a personal question. Well, you don't have to answer. Um, I know your husband is Catholic. Are you Catholic? No. No. Nope. Because, I feel like Catholicism has such a um, 
famously intense relationship with the abjection of the body uh, to the point of like essentially worshiping images of gore like images that are deliberately horrifying like a lot of the imagery that I work from is based on work from isn't the right word the artists that I like who inspire me a lot of them are are making like maybe early modern uh, uh, religious iconography from before the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and like, just like very focused on, I mean, that's body horror work, right? It's all about people being tortured and the, the, the literature about it, like uh, geographic romantic literature is also just like, lurid accounts of people being tortured in horrible ways that probably never happened a lot of them um and images of just like blood gushing people who are skeletally skeletally thin people who their faces are are distorted by pain or unhappiness uh so when i think of like body horror and religion like that's where my mind goes uh I think that is part of it. Although a lot of that well, stuff. When I think about myself in your position, I'm like, how is she not? How does she resist being Catholic? <laughs> uh, it's, it's got a lot of stuff going for and against it. <laughs> <laughs> if I could believe in God, I'd be a Catholic tomorrow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very adjacent to it. It's, uh, it's around <laughs> me all the time. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that's, that's very first serious. Some of the imagery you're describing, I don't know enough about the history, but I would kind of guess it was a little bit of like an, like, uh, uh, had a little bit of a trauma quality at the time. Like there must have been a certain amount of, uh, oh, right. Yeah, for sure. It was an exploitation sort of like, ooh, they, then they tore off her dress. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The idea is absolutely like to titillate, yeah. uh, yeah. but also, you However, know, to, yeah, to shock it, into uh, compliance. Right. We well, you know, like you about trauma. It's uh, it's a cartoon yeah, yeah. exaggeration of a true genre that has you know a very serious intent. And I would yeah, say, and then that, you, know, you have like this intense emotional experience yeah. with the thing, and that makes you love it, even if the emotional experience is negative. Yes. Yep. I'm sorry, you finish your thought and then I'll say yeah, things. That, that's all. <laughs> no, it's kind of interesting to me, though, that it's like, you know, um, Julia, you're kind of coming from body horror from this, like, this, like, fascination with the, these, like, religious institutions and their, like, kind of fetishization of the body almost. And then Ezra, <laughs> on the other hand, is, is inter like, talking about this very real situation in America where it's like a lot of us can't don't have health care and our bodies are expected to be really invulnerable in ways that are extremely unhuman and unfair, right? So kind of two different ends of, of approaching the body in that sense. Um, well, because we live in like this culture where ev everything that should be a collective project has been outsourced into the individual. Uh, and then if we fall short of being uh, of participating in society in the right way, then that's because of our own personal failings, right? So uh, there's like a whole industry around uh, wellness and we have all these, like everybody remembered to do this thing and that thing to stop the spread of COVID when really that should be a collective project, that should be a socialized project, that shouldn't be on individual responsibility. Uh, but in order to make people comply with that, you have to uh, link it with um, worthiness. You have to add a moral component. So one of the things that's horrifying about your body breaking down in our society is that we associate that with personal failing, with moral failing, with, with there's something wrong with you. And you know this if you ever like, have had an accident or an emergency that you had to take time off work. Uh, even if people know in their minds that it's not your fault, they will deal with you as if you should have known better than to get sick. Uh, and in your position, they would have been too smart to do that. Do you know what I mean? 
that's yeah, like I think, that's I think one even... of the most horrifying things about being injured is that people think you're a fucking idiot for having right. an accident. I, I think even like with COVID, like I I have to keep reminding myself, I'm like, it's no one's fault if they get sick, right? Like, yes, we're supposed to be social distancing, wearing masks and all this, but it's like, you know, I live in a city where like, you know, we have a huge university and it's like, it's not the college kids fault that they're here, right? Um, but there's, so yeah. Um, Ezra, I didn't, I don't know if you had anything to add on, on, on all of that. You, it looked like you were going to say something earlier, but. I have nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, I guess I, I do want like to talk. argue that would be fine. <laughs> we, totally, totally open to the argument as well. Um, but since it came up, like one of the first things I thought about immediately when I was, you know, going through going back over all your books, thinking about body horror was the pandemic and how living through this pandemic has changed your approach to thinking about the body in this way. Um, especially because we have this strange balance between like this intense like regulation of the body that's happening right now but at the same time you know we're all very distant from each other we're not like engaging with that many as many bodies on a daily basis as we once were when we were like going out and doing stuff so I'm just interested in how this this experience has changed your storytelling practice and your approach to thinking about the body I think for me, it's, it's, it's happening, everything is happening and changing so fast, but I feel like I haven't had the mental bandwidth to stop and think creatively about how this is going to affect me, knowing full well that in the next five years, we're going to be inundated with like a new like genre or like a new like library of tropes in entertainment where people are just processing everything that they've experienced during this because it's going to affect everybody no matter what. Um, I think the way it's changed, like the way I am living in relation to my just constant existential body horror is that I've become acutely aware of every single change that's happening in my body because I'm like looking for those coronavirus symptoms. Like if I get like, in, like a little itch in my throat, I'm like super keenly aware of things like that more than I have been before. And I think that on top of the isolation of quarantine, is a whole new type of horror that like I, like I said, like in five years, you're gonna see just like an inundation of movies about people that are trapped in one place dealing with like a plague that's ravaging the planet. I definitely I was gonna have say too, much like, more like, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was gonna say too, I have been getting this question at different interview interviews about how the pandemic has changed stuff for me like my perceptions but it's like this isn't like new like i am descended from like hawaiian people and native american people and like infectious disease has wiped out both of my heritages <laughs> like my people so uh this is the same thing that's been going on forever um uh, people have maintained the same attitudes and like disregard for human life so I don't think that has changed that much. Like that stuff weighs pretty heavily on my work. Um, uh, and yeah, people's perceptions and how they feel the right to enact their own will upon your body, I think is also a strong um, component of body horror, not just the internal aspect, but like elements working on you from the outside um, against your will. Uh, I'm thinking about that a lot. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking about like, so I taught a science fiction literature class about plague and contagion um, a couple years ago. And I was like, so, I, so I've been thinking about that class a lot. And I'm like, I'm so angry that none of the narratives that we, <laughs> we investigated, like really talked about like, just how banal this whole like experience would actually be. Um, and Julia, I think Did that- you not, you haven't read my, read my book, Black, no, uh, Laid Waste? No, no, no. Yes, yeah. So that I, I did. That's have like read the it. most boring say, plague book that you can read. I was gonna say Julia was the only like I, I'm going to teach your comic next time because I'm like this is the only uh, like representation that actually feels like what it is like to live through a pandemic or you know um, yeah. So <laughs> it'll be on my syllabus for for next time. That's lucky for my imagination. At the time that I wrote that, I hadn't had that experience, although. 
I mean, I had what felt to me like emotionally similar experiences, which is why I wrote the book. Uh, but I mean, also the people in laid waste are living in a much more advanced state of uh, societal decay than the one that we have encountered yet in this plague. But being subject to crises is um, the natural state of, I was gonna say humanity, but of all animals. Um, and if we have lived in a time of relative peace and prosperity up until now, that's extraordinary luck and coincidence. I don't think this, this experience sucks and it's not something that we should accept as the status quo, but it also like, it's not unprecedented. It makes me so upset every time people are like, oh, we're in these unprecedented times. Like we're really not, which is why we should be handling it better than we are. But we go through trauma and then we just forget <laughs> how to mitigate it. Um, or people's greed really just wins out, honestly. <laughs> they know what to do, but they're just like, mm, but I oh, have You know, as soon as they get there, <laughs> then they're like, good luck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like people who know that they have the ability to uh, retreat to like a, a bunker or whatever. They're like, their biggest concern about global warming is that their beach house might be submerged. Like, they cannot be made to care on a fundamental level. They are not, they don't have that empathy. They know it's the, the, the concern does not come home to them. Uh, so right, we can't historic expect them to help us. They just won't. Right. Which is why we have is to it kill them. <laughs> <laughs> right. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. It's the first time anybody has ever said that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like this. This is not of, the like, official opinion of SPX. <laughs> right. The retweets are not endorsement. We all have to like lawyer up now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, no it, it makes me think of what Sloan was saying earlier about like, you know, this is the historical context for so many communities who are not privileged, right? Um, and now it's like, well, well, everyone is dealing with this and, and um, there's this, this deep lack of empathy or care or this idea that like, we're just like imagining that things will like go away, right? And these problems won't be here anymore. More and more of us are forced to realize that our uh, privilege of not being affected by things like this is not because of our inherent superiority. All the people who used to say like, well, if I was poor, I would just eat rice and beans every night mm -hmm. are starting to have to put their money with their, where their mouth is, which is good for them. Right. Um, so for Sloan and Ezra, um, I was noticing when I was revisiting your books, when I was uh, looking at Prison Stalker and then Bottom Feeders, I was like, wow, in both of these cases, like, the body horror that's generated is intimately tied to place, right? Whether that's like an alien world that we're unfamiliar with or the South side of Chicago. So I was wondering if you could talk about that uh, interaction between place and the body. Um, and then Kate and Julia, if you wanna jump in as well. Um, you first, Ezra. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, like, it's kind of like a chicken or the egg question with bottom feeders, because bottom feeders started as like, a political statement that I wanted to make. And then I just started to sort of figure out ways to wrap it around the things that I like to write about and the worlds that I like to live in and that I find interesting. Um, but I think fundamentally, it, like the place in bottom feeders, specifically the building, which is it, it sounds cliche to say that like your location is a character in the story, but I think in bottom feeders, like since the building is somewhat sentient, it like literally is a character in the story. Um, and so I think that's 
why there's so much of a focus on on the building and the way that the building interacts with people in that story. But that story specifically was born from my experiences being like a young starving artist moving to Chicago and living in like semi-industrial, like semi-habitable spaces and thinking about the ways that those spaces changed me and, and, and especially the ways I changed those spaces and the way I formed those spaces and those neighborhoods around like what I wanted in a neighborhood. Bottom Feeders is really about me exploring my complicity as a gentrifier, <laughs> as like someone with means moving into a neighborhood of like lower means in Chicago when I first moved there as an artist and specifically being a person of color who is in a position of a gentrifier. So Bottom Feeders was like, this is not answering your question at all, but this is where Bottom Feeders came from. It was me like exploring that complicity um, and looking at the ways that, like I said, like I'm changed by a place, but more so how I am changing that place and, and specifically more so how people with even greater means than I had as a starving artist or didn't have great means are changing places to this day in basically every neighborhood that I've ever lived in. Like I've never lived in a wealthy neighborhood. I've always lived in neighborhoods that I could afford and I'm always witnessing those changes in neighborhoods. Yeah, I was um, thinking as you were talking, Ezra, Ezra um, so I, I went to Chicago, uh, for, I did my undergrad at a university on the south side of Chicago, University of Chicago, and the disparity there between like this having this very like wealthy rich university in the middle of the south side um and that those tensions i mean i think it like it makes perfect sense to me that it's like it kind of all centers around the body because you're thinking about how your physical presence there is changing that landscape and yeah so i'm sorry slow i also i cut you off so go ahead <laughs> no it's all good no worries um yeah for prism stalker obviously this book is a lot about like colonization and the effects of imperialism um but the world is all biopunk so like everything is literally alive not like sentient but it's alive um and i feel like with that i'm kind of exploring like i'm like the way i draw body horror you can't really tell between when i'm like reveling in like the disgusting horror of it or when i'm exalting it because i think those are both like equally um very like rich veins to tap into um but yeah, a lot of it is, a lot, of the, a lot of it also has to do with like psychosomatic like perception as well and how the culture, how culture shapes how you perceive yourself. Um, and that kind of is drawn from my experience growing up in Hawaii and like the concept of blood quantum, of being like mixed, um, of, and that like tangibly affecting what happens to me in the world and what sort of privileges I do or do not have. Um, same with how culture um, changes your perception and how institutions treat you with regards to like illness as well. Um, so it's all kind of tangled up for me, the body and the place in society basically. Yeah, I mean, Sloan, even in your new book, uh, like which is not body horror at all, like that really, but it's, very visceral like you have these two girls who are like extremely active um and you introduce them to us like one is surfboarding and the other is playing basketball at the time so there's still this like attention to like how they are able to move through spaces and what effect that has yeah totally for sure yeah kate and julia i don't know if you wanted to jump in on this question or i'm good Okay. <laughs> I don't think I have anything to contribute to that. Okay. Um, so when I, as I was reading Bottom Feeders, Ezra, I noticed um, that your main character has a Candyman poster in the background. <laughs> and I was, Candyman is one of my favorite films. So, and it was very appropriate, like nod to Candyman writing a story about the South Side. Um, I think it's the only, <laughs> the only film to like really capture Chicago. <laughs> um, but I'm interested in, in all of your influences um, for doing this kind of work and approaching um, horror and comics and specifically body horror and comics. So, you know, films or painters or who are you thinking about when you're, when you're creating these stories and doing this work? I mean, I think Clive Barker is definitely uh, the grandfather of, of body horror, right? I mean, there's, there's so much there to work with. Um, 
and his uh you know he always links like uh the the physical breakdown of the body to uh to desire to lust um that's like that's what lets the evil in um is the desire to be uh to commingle your body with other bodies if that makes sense uh it's complicated in Candyman because the reason that he is lynched is because he uh he had a lover who was a white woman right somebody who's seen Candyman more times than me just give me a thumbs up here yeah, that's how the movie is, but the movie, but the original story wasn't about race. The original story was set in England, and I don't think it was about race, it was about class. I'm sorry. Oh, you said it wasn't about race, it was about class. Yeah, I haven't read it. I've only seen the movie. I, the only Clive Barker that I've read is The Hellbound Heart. I think definitely the um, the type of work that the type of horror that excites me the most is uh, probably audiovisual. Yeah, like movies. David Lynch is probably a big influence on me more than I would like to say. Or John Carpenter. That's all very basic stuff. Uh, but it's the good stuff, so. You know. <laughs> I mean, I think it's that a lot of the things that influence me are not necessarily things that other people experience as horrifying. Uh, you know, I, uh, a lot of times my stories come out of me trying to uh, make to like balance an equation between an experience that I have and the way that I think I should feel about it versus the way that I actually experienced it. Um, which is not a horror question so much as it's a question of romance. Because horror is something that uh, you experience, like it, it happens in your mind and it happens in your body. Romance is, only a social experience. Uh, romance is how you understand things that hurt you but that you like. Does that make sense? Um, you know, romance is a kind of pain, but it's a kind of pain that you want. Um, and I don't just mean romantic, like, uh, like sexual love. Um, but the romance of the open road or whatever like the reason that that's romance and not just the fun of the open road is that a road trip fucking sucks but like it sucks in a fun way where like we're doing this grueling thing because it like means something that's that meaning is what makes is what romance is so uh i'm sorry that was a whole tangent uh but i do think that uh, what happens in my work is a lot of like experiences that are horrifying that are treated in a romantic way, kind of like the the hagiographic romances that I referred to earlier, where it's a story about somebody being tortured, but it's supposed to, you're supposed to like admire it. You're supposed to be like, oh my God, she loved Christ so much that she let these people rip her breasts off. Like, you know, it's supposed to, and like, how, what do you do with that in your real life? Like, if somebody actually captured you and ripped your breasts off, it's not like that's never happened. It happens probably every day. Uh, is that really how you're supposed to feel about it? Is that how you're supposed to understand it? If that happens to you, maybe you would like to be able to understand it that way, but I don't think humans really can. Anyway. Yeah, I was 
I was thinking when I was I was rereading your books, Julia, I was like, in a lot of cases, like the this like engagement with the body or um that is like maybe frightening or grotesque is often like an occasion for like intimacy, for example, um, or like a deeper kind of connection between your characters. I mean, it's the same thing, right? Like uh people experience uh I'm not a brain scientist, so I'm going to say this in a way that is inherently ignorant and stupid, but uh, feelings like uh, sexual excitement and uh, panic or fear, those are on the same like neural circuit. They're basically the same emotion. Uh, and you like in other parts of your brain create a context for that experience which makes you decide whether you like it or you don't uh but they're linked to one another so for example if you um if you make somebody do something dangerous like they made a bunch of people walk across like a rickety rope bridge uh and then you give them an opportunity to flirt with somebody they're much more likely to uh, try to hook up with that person if they did something that they feel was frightening, if they've just had an experience that triggered fear in them, because that's like, they already have those feelings happening, like the excitement, the arousal, not sexual arousal, but, you know, physical arousal that you experience uh, from fear, like, those feelings very readily are transmuted into the arousal of desire. Um, and again, like I think that that can be a tricky and elusive distinction to make uh, when somebody when you are transgressed upon. Uh, you know, when you feel afraid, when you feel angry, it's because you're, there's some kind of boundary that's been violated. But if you desire somebody, if you love somebody, you want them to violate you. You want to create that intimacy where you, uh, where somebody can touch you in that way. Um, you want to break down those boundaries. And It's so, uh, you can switch from one to the other, or I, I can, uh, in a way that is alarming sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, something that at one point was romantic to you can become horrifying when you right. uh, have like a new context for the relationship or the person, do you know what I mean? Right. And often that's like the, when I think of like what really scares me, like the stories that really scare me, that's like, it's those stories where it's like, oh, I had this personal relationship with someone and things like something changed about them. And that's, t you know, like the shining or like um, thinking about like hereditary, but Kate, were you going to say something earlier? No. Okay. Um, so I think we're just about out of time, but um do you do any of y'all want to talk about what you're working on now if anything i know <laughs> we're in a pandemic so we might not be like super <laughs> productive right now but um um i'll jump in um so uh i've been working on a couple of very very like out there body horror kind of sexual religious projects but they're all shelved because uh, the schools are closed and there's just no time to like drop out of this world. So I've been working on a series about harm reduction in the context of um, opioid use. So specifically addressing like overdose prevention from um, like a safer use perspective, um, which is for a needle exchange and outreach program here in New Orleans. And then um, I'll adapt it for national use. So it's really just an information rich kind of judgment free comic. Very cool. Go ahead, um, Ezra. <laughs> I uh, just finished the script for a new piece. Um, it's a crime thriller that 
um, is based on the history of the term gator bait, gator baiting, which Kate might know something about being <laughs> from New Orleans. Um, but I guess, like, somewhat in answer to your previous question about what are in, like about our influences, I think for me, my biggest influence, my biggest inspiration is just research. Like, once I start researching something, like I love like. Wes Craven and Clive Barker and David Cronenberg and Charles Burns and everybody like that. But I'm never more terrified than I am when I actually start digging into the actual like hidden history of things, especially when it's in regards to body horror and especially when it's in regards to the way that marginalized people have been treated by establishments through history. Uh, so that's, it's, this is, so my new crime story, um, which is like a, it's like a full like graphic novel, uh, is really diving into the way that those histories inform um, uh, the current generation in terms of generational trauma. That sounds amazing. <laughs> um, I'm working on Prism Stalker 2. You can see pages behind me. Um, this one deals a lot with uh, the planet that the character's on, which is sentient. Um, it deals with like thought as an infection um, and giving up autonomy uh, for peace. Um, and yeah, it's very, uh, it's very much the future through an indigenous lens, a communal lens. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm working on. That sounds amazing. I love that idea of, um, thought, infection as thought. That's, yeah. <laughs> Julia, did you want to, do you have anything you're working oh. on or want to share? No, I, I don't. I don't like to answer that question. I don't talk about what I'm working on. Sorry. Oh yeah, no problem. All right, awesome. Well, I'm excited to read all these, everything that's coming out from you guys. Um, and it's this pleasure is uh, this panel has really been a pleasure for me. So thank you for your time. Thank you and so much. It was really great to talk with you all. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I appreciate it. You guys. <laughs>